Hello, I'm Raj Rajagopalan. I'm a professor in the operations and supply chain area in the data science and operations department at the Marshall School of Business. Welcome. I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on supply chains. There are many natural questions everybody has. Why are there significant shortages for long periods for certain products, food items, household essentials, medical supplies? Is it because of global supply chains? Is it because, you know, stuff comes from China or Vietnam or Europe? And then what do firms do to address the shortages? Will the pandemic result in long-term changes to supply chains? Will they become more localized? What can firms do to make supply chains more resilient to disruptions of the types that we have seen? And will they come at the expense of lower supply chain efficiency? Will products become more expensive because of this? Finally, we are all concerned about healthcare supply chains because we've heard about shortages of masks, ventilators. So the question is, how can healthcare supply chains better prepare for a pandemic like this? We will delve into each one of these questions. Let's consider now the issue of significant shortages for several products. We've had shortages for toilet paper, food, disinfectant wipes. Normally, supply chain shortages occur either because there are large demand fluctuations or because of supply shocks, like a plant shutting down. Let me first talk about what can happen on the demand side. When there are small demand fluctuations, say 20 to 30% increase, inventory in a supply chain can take care of that. But with toilet paper, we saw people buy it for many months usage rather than a few weeks. If everybody does that, demand fluctuations are huge and this leads to shortages. But the shortages are also due to more significant disruptions in the supply chain. Let's look at a couple of different things. First, there are changes in the demand streams or segments. Since most people stayed at home, demand for toilet paper used in homes shot up, while toilet paper used in commercial establishments, offices, restaurants went down. Turns out the products used in these two settings are somewhat different. The same thing is true for many other products. Consider vegetables, meats, etc. supply to restaurants. Demand at restaurants down, and so they order less of these things. The supply chain serving consumers is different from the supply chain serving commercial establishments. And in some cases, like toilet paper or food, even the product or the package sizes may be different. Also remember, the increased demand can occur at multiple levels, not just at the consumer level. There can be overordering by retail stores because they see more demand, they tend to order more from their supplier. Who's a distributor? The distributor in turn may order much more from the manufacturer. This is called the bullwhip effect, which has been well studied by researchers in supply chain. There are ways of dealing with the bullwhip effect and mitigating the disruptions, as we'll see shortly. These changes are all on the demand side, but there can also be supply shocks. For instance, a distribution center or a meat processing plant may shut down because workers contract the virus. Now, clearly this leads to supply shocks and there is no supply. If it's a few days, it's not a big deal because inventory in the supply chain provides a buffer. But if it lasts for several weeks or months, that can essentially completely disrupt supply chains. And in this particular pandemic, we've had both supply and demand shocks. And this is very, very rare historically. Supply chains have had supply shocks because of earthquakes or tsunami. And sometimes we've had demand shocks because of massive promotions or hurricanes or a recession. But we have rarely had supply and demand shocks at the same time and that too at a global level. Now it's important to remember that these supply chain disruptions and shortages are not necessarily because supply chains are global. Toilet paper is a good example. Almost all the toilet paper consumed in the US is produced here at different plants across the country. The same is true for many food items. So supply chain shortages can occur independent of whether supply chains are global or local because it depends upon the nature of demand and supply shocks, where they take place for which products, and it takes time for a supply chain to adapt. But of course, if a supply chain is global, then disruptions are more likely because global supply chains also have longer lead times. Now let's look at what firms have done to address some of these shortages. In the case of toilet paper, firms have increased production. 
and move production to products that consumers use at homes and reduce production of toilet paper used in commercial establishments. They are also producing less variety because whenever you produce a variety of different products, you have changeovers in equipment and those things take more time. This is a way to increase capacity. They also have focused more on producing essential products. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that firms cannot increase capacity dramatically. If the capacity constraint is based on equipment capacity, you cannot change it easily in the short run. But you can increase labor capacity by doing overtime or working on weekend or doing multiple shifts. Now let's look at how the pandemic will lead to long-term changes to supply chains. Will they become more localized? To look at this question, it's important to understand why supply chains have become global over the past several decades. The global dispersion of supply chains depends on labor content and wages and ocean transportation cost. Clearly, if the labor content is very high for a product and wages are very low in certain countries, there is going to be naturally more production in such locations. This is what happened with apparel, which has shifted over the past several decades to countries with lower wages, from US to South Korea to China to Bangladesh. The other important driver is lower ocean transportation cost, which have been declining substantially for the past 50 years, thanks to container shipping. Supply chains also depend upon factors such as tariffs, and we have our recent example with many medical supplies. They come from China, and over the last two years, we've had an increase in tariffs, and so the imports from China have actually declined, but imports from other countries have increased correspondingly, as the accompanying chart shows. Gloves, for instance, don't come from China. Gloves come from Malaysia and many other countries and are also produced locally. Supply chains also depend upon exchange rates. For instance, the peso has, you know, become much weaker in the past few months, which means that it has become more attractive to produce in Mexico rather than in China, in which case lead times are shorter but it takes a little bit of time for supply chains to adapt to these changes in tariffs or exchange rates because you have to find new suppliers in these new locations. They have to ramp up their production capacity. They have to hire more people. Finally, another important factor is the location of raw materials and parts to supply network. For instance, for many electronics products, say a smartphone, it's not just the final assembly which is done in China, but many of the components that go into a smartphone or a computer, displays, chips, etc., are procured in Asia. So you can see the supply network tends to be close to assembly and moving the entire supply chain is not going to happen quickly, even if exchange rates or tariffs change. It takes months or years. So for all these reasons, supply chains will remain global in the near term. They may also remain global in the long term because consumers want lower prices and if labor cost is very low somewhere and transportation costs continue to be low, then such global production keeps costs low. Of course, quality is also important, but over time quality is improved in many low cost production locations. And so if the quality is good and the prices are low, naturally you procure from these countries unless quick response is critical. If short response time is very critical, then localization becomes important as we have seen in this pandemic. Now let's look at what firms can do to make supply chains more resilient to disruptions. And if this will come at the expense of supply chain efficiency. There has been a lot of research that's been done in this area over the past decade. It turns out that the best way to deal with demand fluctuations and small supply delays is to hold safety inventory. And this is sufficient for most demand fluctuations, which is around 20 to 30%. Based on decades of research, there are excellent optimization methods available for determining how much safety stock to protect against demand fluctuations and small supply delays. This has been incorporated in many software programs used by firms. And in fact, there are newer approaches using machine learning to further optimize where to hold inventory, how much inventory to hold, etc. But research has shown that holding a lot of inventory is not a good approach to deal with supply disruptions, especially when they occur very rarely, say once in 10 or 20 years and last for a long time. There are a number of things that firms can do in such cases that have been shown to be very effective. One of the best thing to do 
is to have multiple supply sources in just a few different geographical locations. Research shows that even having two or three suppliers in different locations provides a substantial advantage, perhaps most of the advantage. If one of them is closer to the market sir, then this turns out to be very helpful. And the two or three supply sources don't have to have the same amount of capacity. One can still be a low cost supply source, which is the major supply source. The other can be a smaller supplier, maybe a higher cost one, but it's closer to the demand. And so in some ways you get the best of both worlds where most of your demand is met from low cost supply sources that may be far away. And then some of your demand is satisfied from the higher cost supply source that can quickly react to demand fluctuations. Also, this protects you against supply disruptions at one location. This source should have significant excess capacity which is deployed when needed. The second thing that firms have done is to monitor carefully information and material flows and monitor the supplier network. This requires visibility into the entire supply chain network, both upstream and downstream. Understanding where is the inventory in the supply chain, supplier capacity, supplier capabilities, etc. Now clearly there is some information that's private that suppliers or distributors may not be willing to share. But certainly you can have visibility into your company's inventory at distributors or retailers. Similarly, when you have long-term contracts with your suppliers, they are your partners. You can always have sufficient visibility. This has been true for a long time in auto and electronic supply chains, which has helped them tremendously in dealing with disruptions and being efficient. A third thing that companies can do is to have contingent supply chains they negotiate the option to increase capacity with a different supplier. This has all been planned out so that if something goes wrong at one supply source, you can immediately start working on the other supply source and they plan and pay for excess capacity. Finally, firms can actually simulate their supply chains and use it to stress test them. What happens if a supply source is shut down? How long before there'll be shortages? What happens if I hold a little more inventory? What happens if there's a port strike? What happens if demand declines? Such a simulation is an excellent vehicle for disruption planning. Now, let's look at the healthcare supply chain because as we have noticed in this pandemic, we were desperate for ventilators, masks, etc. Many of these items are sourced both locally and globally. In fact, the US both exports and imports many of these items, masks, gloves, ventilators, etc., as the accompanying chart shows. Some of them are sourced locally, example ventilators, but there was still fear of shortages. Ventilator is a good example to explore further. On the one hand, we heard from several regions of the country that there were likely to be significant shortages. Yet, at the same time, there were regions in the country where there were plenty of ventilators available. If there was a way of getting the ventilators from regions with excess supply to the ones with excess demand, the issue could have been resolved. In addition, there was supposed to be a large federal and state stockpile, but unfortunately, it turns out that there was no visibility into this inventory, and some of the ventilators may be old models that are possibly obsolete, according to a report by the Society for Critical Care Medicine. Hospitals and states were competing with each other for ventilators, paying exorbitant prices. In this case, visibility into the inventory and location of the ventilators would have made a significant difference. Also, in such a situation, it makes sense to have centralized allocation based on the needs of different regions. Otherwise, one hospital or city may overorder, worried about limited supply, depriving another hospital that urgently needs them. Now, how can healthcare supply chains and the government better prepare for significant disruptions? The first thing that federal government needs to have is a strategic federal reserve, something like we do for oil, for all basic medical supplies like PPE, basic drugs, etc. In fact, there is a national stockpile, but inventory of many items were not replenished over the years. Some equipment, other masks had become obsolete we need to manage this national stockpile better and it should be held in multiple locations across the country but with good visibility. So this is absolutely critical. 
In fact, many of the medical distributors in the US are now cooperating with FEMA to make sure that they manage the allocation of scarce medical supplies and decide which region to send it to because everybody will over order in a situation like this. Research has shown that centralizing inventory has many benefits called risk pooling benefits and works well to address demand fluctuations in different locations. I have found this in my own work with firms holding inventory in numerous locations. But carrying a lot of inventory is not a good approach to deal with supply disruptions that occur rarely and last for a while. To address potential supply disruptions, we need to have multiple supply sources, as I mentioned earlier. And in particular, we need to have at least one domestic supply source for these items. This may be a higher cost source, but it is necessary to make the supply chain resilient. It should also have sufficient excess capacity that can be used when needed. Having domestic supply sources with excess capacity is a critical need for many healthcare items. This may appear to be costly, but resilience requires this. We've often heard in the past few months about how we are waging a war with the virus. Well, to fight wars, we keep defense forces, equipment and inventories of weapons ready to fight, even if they are not used most of the time. We have to take, think the same way about pandemics. Finally, it is important to plan ahead for major supply chain disruptions, even if there's considerable uncertainty about the source and duration of disruptions. As Eisenhower said, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Thank you.